This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. My wife and I have always attended different churches, but now we have children, and we're looking for a church we can attend together. We've been told to choose the one that feels right to us. But with there being so many churches, how can we know which one is right? I've been a member of a number of churches in my lifetime. Some big, some small, you name it. They all believe in the same God, but worship in a lot of different ways. Does it really matter? Growing up, my friends and I did everything together, except church. And I've always wondered, why not? If we believe in the same God, why are there so many different churches? With all the different religions and churches represented in the military, the chaplain holding one service where we can all come together for worship, it makes it simple. I mean, isn't that just like the church we read about in the Bible? I heard a preacher say once that all Christian churches are okay, even if they don't all teach the same things. How can that be? I've always been confused by that. Have you ever wondered why there are so many different churches and practices and beliefs? Is it possible that every denomination is right? Does God approve of this kind of division and confusion? And does it even really matter? Why are there so many different churches? And does it matter to God? Is He pleased with the current situation in the religious world? If I were to ask you exactly how many different churches exist in the world today, what would you say? You'd probably say, I I don't know, a lot, I guess. And that would be right. There are a lot. In fact, I looked this up recently, and I found that there are approximately 38,000 different churches. 38,000! Friends, that's amazing. And think about how confusing this can be for a person who is seeking the truth, because you have one church over here that's teaching this practice, and, and another church that's teaching just the opposite. And one church says that item A is sinful, and, and another church says item A is mandatory. Who's right? Can they both be right? And of course, some people will tell you, well, that's good. It's good to have variety. Just attend the church of your choice. And they'll say, you know, one church is just as good as another. We're all going to the same place anyway. They're just different paths leading us to the same location. Dear friend, may I respectfully tell you that the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. When I read my New Testament, I read about only one church. But when I look around me today and I see those who profess Christianity, I see thousands. Now the question is, how did we get from one to thousands? And the answer is something went wrong. Something went severely wrong. But you see, it didn't go wrong with God. It went wrong with man. Now here's the first point I want us to observe as we consider this subject together, and that is, in the Bible we read about only one church. I want you to use your imagination with me for a minute. And I want you to imagine that there is such a thing as a time machine. And I want you to imagine that you can get in this time machine and travel back to the first century, to the day that the Lord established His church. And and you get out and you see all of these converts to Christianity, about about 3,000 of them. And you walk up to one of them and, and you ask him, Sir, I would like to know what denomination did you just become a part of? What would he say? He would probably say, I don't know what you're talking about. I I mean, what church did you become a part of? Was it the Methodist or the Catholic or the Baptist? Which one was it? He'd say, sir, I I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of a denomination. I've never heard of these groups that you're discussing. All I know is that I became a part of the church that belongs to Jesus Christ, the church of Christ. And that would be exactly right, because there was only one. Acts 2.47 says, The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And this fits perfectly with what Jesus promised in Matthew 16.18. He promised, Upon this rock I will build my church. The Apostle Paul later echoes the sentiment of the one church as he's speaking to the elders in Ephesus. He tells them to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Acts 20.28 In the book of Ephesians, we're told that God has put all things under Christ's feet and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body. And so the church of Christ and the body of Christ are the same thing. And then the singularity of the church is nailed down in Ephesians 4.4 when He says there is 
one body. Dear friend, when one reads the New Testament, he is impressed by the fact that there existed only one church. Well, what if someone came along and wanted to start some different divisions of that one church, different denominations, if you will? Would that be okay? And the answer to that question is no, that would not be okay. I want you to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul as he writes to the church in Corinth. He says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1.10 Now friends, how does that mesh with what we see in the religious world today, with all of the different denominations and divisions and, and sects who are all teaching different things? And the answer is, it doesn't mesh at all. It is completely foreign to the New Testament concept of the church. Now, more specifically, what was the problem with the church in Corinth? I want you to listen again. This is verse 12. Paul says, Now I say this, that each one of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? You see, within the first century church, we see the seeds of denominationalism. Some were starting to hold to Paul, while others were holding to Apollos, others were holding to, to Cephas, to Peter, and others to Christ. Divisions were starting to form, and Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, condemns this, and he makes it clear that this is not of God. Okay, as we seek to answer the question, why are there so many churches, I want us to notice that God predicted that there would be a departure from the New Testament pattern. You see, despite the clarity of the New Testament with regard to the oneness of the church, and despite the warnings against division, God knew that divisions would come. In fact, the Bible foretells of it and, and warns against it several times. One of these warnings comes from a passage we mentioned a moment ago. It, it's the conversation between Paul and the Ephesian elders. He tells them to shepherd the church which was purchased by the blood of Christ. He says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Now, it's interesting that Paul tells the leaders of, of this church, this congregation, that a departure would come from them. And the reason this is so interesting is because one of the first departures in the church was with regard to its leadership and its organization. Now, another warning concerning departure is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let's read this one together. It says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly. That is, the Holy Spirit is speaking very plainly here that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. We'll see in history that two of the specific departures that later take place relate to forbidding marriage and not being allowed to eat certain foods. Now, thus far, we see that according to the New Testament pattern, there was only one church. But we also see that God predicted that, that there would be a departure from that New Testament pattern. All right, let's get to the key question. Why are there so many churches today? How did a basic Bible belief system with a unified group of people turn into literally thousands of different denominations with different practices and different beliefs. Well, history tells us that very early on there came along splinter groups who had ideas and doctrines contrary to that of the first century church and contrary to the doctrine that they had received and practiced. Some of these groups include the Gnostics around AD 125, the Montanists around AD 156, the Manetians around A.D. 244, and the Novatians around A.D. 251. Now, one of the largest and most significant divisions that relates to the early church relates to its leadership and involved the Roman emperor by the name of Constantine. Now, from the beginning of God's plan, it was to have elders and deacons in the church. And you can read about this in 1 Timothy and Titus. 
And these elders had authority only over the congregations where they were members. And that's the way God established it. Each congregation was autonomous. But you see, over time, elders began meeting together to discuss problems relating to the various congregations. When you get to the 300s AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine was starting to have interest in this growing group of people known as the Church of Christ. And in AD 313, he passed the Edict of Milan, which ended the persecution against Christians. And you can imagine, this gained in favor with Christians in and around Rome. And so the Roman government began gaining a lot of influence with elders in the Church of Christ, and the end result was a very adverse effect on a large portion of Christ's church. You see, this new relationship led to a meeting between elders in the Church of Christ and Roman officials. This meeting took place in AD 325, and history calls this event the Council of Nicaea. And this meeting gave rise to the first officially recognized departure from the original New Testament church. Now, this newly created denomination took a Latin word, Catholic, which is translated universal, and established a hierarchy very similar to that of the Roman government. They literally took the example of the Roman government and built a church that was based on that model. And so in this new church, there were men who were over several churches or groups of churches, which was a very clear departure from the New Testament pattern. Now, Christians who were faithful to the Bible, those who stood against this newly created Catholic denomination, they were persecuted and ostracized. They had to meet in hiding. But the pure New Testament Church of Christ continued to exist. Now, historically speaking, after the formation and establishment of this Catholic Church, it grew in strength and number and political power. And, and they created new doctrines and man-made traditions, and they enjoy growing political endorsements from the Roman government. In time, their doctrines were made mandates and required of all of the members of the Catholic Church. Notice the dates on the chart as the Catholic Church implemented some of these doctrines long after the formation of their denomination. There was Latin Mass, Purgatory, the first official pope, they called him God on earth. Transubstantiation, the mandate of the celibacy of the priest in 1015. Now, if you look at the timeline, and you'll see that for the first thousand years, there was really only two churches. You had the Church of Christ that began on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. That still existed. And then there was Catholicism. Now, history tells us that in 1054, the Catholic Church split into two denominations. You had Roman Catholicism and the Greek Orthodox Church. Now, during this time, the Bible became more and more unavailable to the common man, and this period became known as the Dark Ages. And the Catholic Church just continued to add man-made doctrines. Examples include indulgences in 1192, the confessional booth in 1215, sprinkling replaced immersion for baptism in 1311, and the Pope was declared infallible. Now, by the time you get to the 1500s, you'll see a lot of activity on the timeline. And this is because there were men such as Martin Luther who began to stand up and say, this is not right. Martin Luther was a German monk, and he hated the sale of indulgences. And he challenged the Pope, saying that the Bible is the only source of authority. Martin Luther's widespread opposition to the Catholic Church ignited a protest movement, which historically is known as the Protestant Reformation. In 1521, another denomination appeared shortly before the Lutheran Church came on the scene. It was known as the Anabaptist. They started as a protest against the Catholic Church and its practice of infant baptism. Anna means again, and they baptized again those who had been baptized as babies in the Catholic Church. But what's really interesting is that the Anabaptist movement spawned several other churches to include the Baptist, the Amish, the Mennonites, and Brethren in Christ. And as religious freedom expanded, Denominationalism continued to grow and to multiply into dozens of factions, and you can see that on the timeline. And this laid a foundation for a multitude of denominations that exist in our present day. 
Now, some of these churches began with a, a noble desire to break free from some clearly unscriptural practices. Others began with less than noble reasoning. You'll notice on the chart that the Church of England started in 1534. This church began as a result of King Henry VIII's desire to have his marriage to Catherine of Aragon annulled. And when the Roman Catholic Church wouldn't grant his annulment, the result was the separation from the Catholic Church and the formation of a new church, the Church of England. Well, what's the point of all of that? The point is, if you look at the chart, the timeline, it represents just a, a small fraction of churches that exist today. Some began with good motives, others with bad motives, but all of them were started by men. Now, if you go back to the top of the chart, you'll see the green line that represents the church started by Jesus Christ. This is the church that began in A.D. 33 in Jerusalem. It's the Church of Christ, the one we read about in the pages of the New Testament. And from history, we see that all other churches were man-made denominations. Now, hopefully, now you can see why there are so many churches. And here's the message that we really need to take to heart. Since Jesus condemns division, we need to be a part of that one church that Jesus established the one that He bought with His blood, and not one of the, the man-made churches that came along later in history. Now, what does all this mean for us today? Does this mean that denominations are wrong? Dear friend, we want to be kind, but we want to be clear. And the answer is, yes, it would have to mean that. All churches, other than the one built by Jesus Christ, exist without New Testament authority or example. Now somebody says, does that mean that good-intentioned, morally upright people and denominations will be lost? Well, let's let the Lord answer this question. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? and cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Dear friend, observe with me that Jesus says that on the day of judgment, there will be good people, people who are teachers, people who claim to hold to the name of Jesus, people who will be lost because they haven't done the will of the Father. Now, the point is that having good intentions is not enough. Having my heart right is not enough. I actually have to follow the New Testament pattern. I want you to listen again to the words of Acts 2.47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Friend, all of the saved people are in the church that one built by Jesus, the same one that existed in Acts chapter 2, the same one that we read about throughout the New Testament, the one that existed prior to all the denominations of man. Now the question is, how do I become a part of that church, the one wherein is salvation? How do I become a part of the one church of the New Testament? And the answer is the same way that they did it in the New Testament. You've got to obey the gospel. You know, sometimes people in the religious world will tell you that there's nothing that you have to obey. They will say you only need to believe. But I want you to listen to the words of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. Now listen to this. He's describing the day of judgment. He says that some people are going to receive rest. Some people are going to receive punishment. He says, when the Lord comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, now listen, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we must obey the gospel. Now, obeying the gospel can be summed up in five short words, hear, believe, repent, confess, and baptism. Now somebody says, what does that mean? Explain that. Well, first a man must hear the gospel. He hears that because of his sin, he has transgressed the will of God and is destined to die eternally in hell. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin 
is death. He also hears that Jesus Christ came as God in the flesh to pay the penalty for his sin so that he doesn't have to. He hears that salvation is found in Christ. Romans 10, 14 indicates if a person does not hear the message of the gospel, he has no hope. Now, upon hearing it, he must also believe it. Now, what does that entail? What must a man believe? Well, he must believe, he must understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John 8, 24, Jesus said, If you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. He must understand that Jesus is deity. John 1, 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And he must, of course, believe in the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. How it is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. And then he arose, defeating death, 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55. And Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And of course, it is crucial, it is crucial that a man believe and understand the body of Christ, which is the church of the New Testament. 2 Timothy 2.10 says that salvation is in Christ. And then a man must repent. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30 says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, repentance is a change of mind brought about by godly sorrow that results in a reformation of life. That's important to understand. Sometimes people will say that repentance is merely changing your life. That's not a good definition of repentance. Repentance is changing your mind, and of course that's followed by a change of life. But then step number four, a person must confess his faith in Christ. Romans 10 and verse 10 clearly tells us, "...for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation." In Acts chapter 8, as Philip was teaching the gospel to the Ethiopian, he said, "'See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized?' Philip responded to the Ethiopian and said, "'If you believe with all of your heart, you may.' And he answered and said, "'I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God.'" That's the confession we're talking about. Not a confession of our sin, but a confession of what we've heard and what we believe. It is an acknowledgement. Yes, we believe these things. Now, finally, involved in obeying the gospel, one must be baptized. Mark 16 and verse 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. You know, baptism as practiced by first century Christians was total immersion. In fact, that's the meaning of baptism. It is the point at which a person is immersed in water, and it's the point in which he contacts the saving blood of Jesus. It's the point at which he has finally obeyed the gospel. Romans 6, 3 and 4 says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so we are buried in the watery grave of baptism. Jesus shed His blood in His death. In baptism, we are buried into His death. We contact that saving blood of Christ, and our sins are washed away. That's why we come out of the watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. Once you've done those things, Acts 2.47 says the Lord will add you to the church. Friends, the church of Christ still exists today just as it did in the first century. You know, some people misunderstand the church of Christ. They think that it's just another denomination alongside a, a string of denominations. But I can assure you that the church of Christ has no earthly head, no legal hierarchy, it wasn't started by any man. It follows no man-made creeds or practices. The Church of Christ just follows the New Testament pattern found in the Bible. We meet on the first day of the week to take communion. We sing a cappella the way the church did in the first century. We pray. We study the Bible together. We hear preaching together. 
We give financially according to how God has blessed us, and Christ is our only head. The church is composed of elders and deacons and evangelists and members, just as it was 2,000 years ago. We abide only in the doctrine of Christ. We cast away all man-made doctrines and creeds, and we are Christians only. Friends, we're not advocating that anyone leave his denomination to join our denomination. We're advocating that men leave all denominations and simply be a part of the one Church of Christ, the one that existed hundreds of years before the churches of today, the one that we read about in the Bible.